Hey, good evening, everyone. I think it's about time here, 8 o'clock. Right on schedule. I hope it's working okay. Uh, let me know, by the way, if somebody wants to chime in, let me know that audio and video are working well tonight. And in a few minutes, uh, we'll get started. Just want to make sure everything's okay first. Hello. I see a couple people chiming in there. Okay, so I gather you can see me. Uh, if somebody could just let me know that audio is good. Hi, Anushka. Daniel, you were the first one. Okay, thanks, Joy. I appreciate that. Okay, well then let me officially welcome you to our um, genetics exam review. Yeah, wahoo, first one of 2019. Okay, so I don't have, um, you know, a lot to say that I didn't tell you in class about the exam itself. Um, you know, really it's nothing too surprising. I actually have kind of previewed almost all the questions uh, between the checkups and the uh, review today. So definitely go back and check uh, those out if you don't remember. Um, I, I really don't think there's going to be anything on there that you'll find particularly complicated or surprising. Okay, as long as you know your basics and remember not to uh, get the terminology mixed up, right? So that you focus on making sure you know what replication is versus transcription and what all the different words mean. I, you know, I'm not too worried. I'm actually pretty confident you guys are going to do great. Uh, but here I am to answer some questions. So let's see, got one from uh, Prene. Uh, he has a question about replication and transcription. Okay, so uh, remember this sort of idea that there really are two completely different processes. Um, what they have in common is, of course, they both involve DNA, because that's kind of the point to genetics, right, is that we have all this information in our DNA. So, you know, we have a lot of things we can do with that information. One of them is, of course, to make a copy when a cell is going to divide. That's replication. Okay, and anything involving DNA has to happen in the nucleus, because the DNA never leaves the nucleus. So replication starts in the nucleus, so you're making a copy of all the DNA, that's what replication means. Uh, so that means you're using DNA polymerase, and you're copying all the DNA, all 46 chromosomes, um, prior to cell division, so that would mean an interphase uh, before the actual process of mitosis meiosis begins. And then uh, once it's all copied, the cell can uh, finish preparing to divide, and it will have two copies, and basically, if you think back, that's when the one sister chromatid becomes two sister chromatids. That is DNA replication, and then those two chromatids can uh, divide. Okay, uh, transcription, really, the only thing it has in common is that it starts in the nucleus with the DNA, right? Different purpose, different, eh, not exactly a different time. Um, pretty much anything you do with DNA has to happen during interphase, right? So. Transcription also happens during interphase, but it's really for the purpose of using the information in DNA to make something. Sometimes that something is RNA, and you just do transcription. Sometimes uh, you make mRNA specifically, and you follow that up with translation if their final product is a protein. Um, since transcription is making RNA, of course it uses RNA polymerase, right? And we do have special, some special terminology, so you start at the RNA polymerase starts at the promoter. Okay, uh, there's no place that replication really starts. It sort of has to happen all along the chromosomes. Okay, so hopefully that's a good review for you. Um, okay, uh, a sort of a related question. Hannah's asking about, does helicase unzip DNA during replication and transcription? Uh, as far as I know, it only happens that way during replication. I don't know why. It's just, I, I don't know if it's just because transcription is kind of a, quicker deal or what exactly, but even when you look at the animation, the biologically accurate ones, it shows the RNA molecule, I'm sorry, the RNA polymerase, it shows part of the, the blob sort of opening up the DNA and then it's copying it at the same time. So for whatever reason, RNA polymerase is able to do that whole job. It might have to do with the fact that you're only copying one side and it's much smaller um, as opposed to sort of, you know, having to copy both sides and go really fast the way that you do in, in replication. Um, Joy is asking about CRISPR. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, for purposes of our class, 
it's really the implications of CRISPR that count. So I'm not necessarily going to go into a lot of detail about how it works. There are some really nice animations and pictures of that. There's one on the back of your uh, biotech guide. You can certainly find one, several, online um, on some of the resources I gave you, or you could look it up. But, you know, the easiest way for sort of the freshman biology take on it is to think of it as an enzyme. It's essentially, uh, part of it is an enzyme that a bacteria used to use, well, probably still does, right, that is used to target uh, particular patterns that are in DNA, okay, and to be able to identify those and do something with them. Often it's to cut it, cut a piece out and replace it with another piece, right? Um, bacteria have their own use for this as part of their sort of immune system, but we have sort of commandeered that, and we've got it so that where we can take this sort of enzyme-like complex program it to recognize a particular pattern, like look for this place in the DNA with this pattern of letters, A, T, G, G, A, C, T, right? We program it to look for that. We can actually put in a little piece uh, of DNA that we want to replace. We can program it to sort of replace a certain portion. Um, you know, we can do many kinds of changes to the DNA using CRISPR. So, you know, again, for purposes of our class, I'd say think of it as essentially like an enzyme that we can control. Okay. Uh, I heard that other classes are learning about the specifics of DNA replication. Okazaki fragments. Wow, be grateful you're not doing that. <laughs> okay. Um, it, yeah, it gets a little complicated. Um, you are not required to know that for my class. Okay, I'm going with the super simple version of replication. Just DNA polymerase, um, copying all the DNA, fast, accurate, uh, it happens during interphase. That's pretty much all you need to know. Okay, yes, the reality is there are a whole bunch more enzymes involved. Um, you can't even copy the two strands in the same way because they have to go in two different directions, and that all gets kind of complicated to explain. So I'm not going to do that right now. Um, but yeah, this is one of those times where you can just like deep breathe, breathe a deep sigh of relief that you don't have to do that or know that. Okay. Uh, Prasant, what are some good... Let me see if I can see your question a bit better. Uh, what are some good sides of uh, GM foods, and what are some reasons that cause people to think GM foods are bad? Um, there's a little bit of a summary of this on my PowerPoint, but if I had to, and it's a complex issue, but if I tried to give you sort of the short version, uh, there are definitely a lot of important positive things that we could do with that. Um, we already are, by the way, and if you think about some possibilities of making food production better or more uh, flexible, Okay, we've got to feed a lot of people in this world, and we're going to have to find ways to make food grow faster, uh, produce more edible parts like bigger fruits and vegetables, um, to be able to grow as the climate changes, right, uh, when it's hotter and drier, because we're going to have to somehow take our current food production, it's estimated, I, I heard recently, that we're going to have to increase it by like 75%. By 2050, we're expecting to have about 10 million, 10 billion people on Earth by then, and you know, almost double our food supply without any additional land, and in fact, probably with less land. So we're going to have to do something to make that happen. And part of that, there's going to be a lot of things, but part of that solution is going to be for us to engineer, frankly, better plants for human food production. Um, so I think that is one of the that's the probably the main positive thing. There's other reasons people do it, just to make foods. Uh, easier to transport, you know, ripen at a different speed, uh, be resistant to uh, potentially pests or something like that. So there's a number of other re reasons that people use it, some of which are more for convenience or, frankly, for profit. Uh, but I think if you look at the sort of um, bigger issues, I think we're going to need that technology to increase our food supply. Um, that being said, there are many, many concerns, right? I think there's a really valid concern about unforeseen environmental issues. Uh, we've already seen that uh, with use of Roundup. Um, you know, people are using this product and then they use a lot more pesticide, I'm sorry, a lot more herbicide, which has turned out to be harmful to a number of, number of other species. Um, you know, there's concern that if we create these products and they sort of get out organisms, really not products, organisms, and they get out in the natural world, they might outcompete uh, other similar organisms, um, like there's a salmon that grows very fast, it might outcompete other salmon, and that might be a problem for those native salmon, because we don't want them to go away, right? That's our, that's our biodiversity, that's our raw material for all this information, 
Remember that when we do genetic, these um, transgenic organisms, mostly we're not making it up. Sometimes we do, but mostly we're borrowing from nature. Nature is like this incredible stockpile. All this biodiversity is this incredible sort of bounty of information of different ways to do things. And mostly we borrow from that. So we don't want to eliminate our biodiversity as we try to improve certain products for ourselves. So that, that's kind of a big concern. There's some other sort of larger uh, economic and political concerns around the idea that uh, for-profit companies might control large portions of our food supply by controlling biotechnology and that they might not always act in the best interests, right? Like maybe not making sure that all people around the world can get access to good food, right? Um, they might not be open about the environmental impacts of this technology. Um, so, you know, there's things like that that I think are also very valid concerns uh, about genetically modified foods. Know that for the most part, um, uh, people have had concerns about health issues, that maybe these foods would be harmful to us. For the most part, that has not really panned out, right? Because normally these other genes are taken from uh, foods that we are already eating, and so they aren't necessarily producing proteins that are going to be a problem. Um, it's not impossible that it could be a problem. There could be issues with people having allergies uh, to a protein that is produced by a food that they didn't sort of know was going to be there, right? So, so there are some potential health issues, but honestly, that's, that's the part that I think people are most afraid of that is probably the least concern. Um, and I think this is where trying to explain these complex issues to people who might not know a lot about science and particularly genetics gets to be kind of difficult, right? So uh, as always, I'm going to encourage you to be um, a smart consumer, keep learning about all these issues so that you can make your own decision, right? One of the big controversial things about um, GM foods is whether we should label them or not, okay? And that isn't really so much of a scientific issue. I mean, you it's related to the science of it, of course, um, but it is an important sort of consumer rights, public information transparency kind of issue. So again, it's kind of hard to talk about some of these science issues without getting into the larger issues, and, and that's pretty much true of everything in biotechnology. Okay, that short version turned into kind of a long version, but um, hopefully that was helpful to you. Okay, so let's see. Sorry, <laughs> ran on the crayon, got it. Uh, ADN allows DNA replication to occur, such as DMA, DNA polymerase to start making complementary bases. Okay, I'm not entirely sure I understand this question. Um, I guess I'm just gonna clarify the wording there. You don't make complementary bases, they're already there, right? Um, I mean, you're... <sighs> Your cells do ultimately make a lot of nuclei. Actually, your liver makes a lot of nucleotides, um, but they're sort of floating around the nucleus of your regular cells. So they're already sort of available. The polymerase is just helping them to form bonds as they sort of match up based on their complementarity. Okay, I think maybe that question was just clarifying the enzymes that were used. Um, Party's, uh, party's asking, how does tyrosinase produce melanin? You know, it's an enzyme. I, I'll be honest, one year I did look up that reaction, and I don't remember it right now. <laughs> it's got some substrate that is related to tyrosine. That's where the name comes from. Tyrosine is uh, one of our amino acids. Um, by the way, here's, here's Pinky here to say hello. Brief break. Brief kitty break. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I don't know the exact reaction. Um it may be more complicated, but I think there's some substrate uh, related to tyrosine that is used to make melanin. Honestly, that's kind of all you need to know. You could probably look it up if you want. You could look up, uh, you know, reaction to produce melanin or tyrosinase or something like that. Uh, mm, yeah, there's a whole conversation going on about RNA and DNA polymerase, but honestly, I don't quite understand the question, so I'm going to let that go. Okay, Ooh, we got a lot of questions, Joey. I'm not sure who you are, but it's hard to understand your questions. So I'm going to move on. Um, her husband like to their offspring or other generations. Okay, it sounds like Rian is now asking about horizontal gene transfer. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, Ryan is asking about the difference between tyrosine and tyrosinase. Tyrosine, as I mentioned, is actually just one of the, the 20 or so amino acids that we produce. And amino acids don't just have to be used to make protein. Um, another, a number of them are chemical precursors for other things. If you remember that term precursor, it means that we can do other chemical reactions and make other kinds of products. So sometimes they're building blocks for things that are not proteins, just so you know that because you'll see them come up um, and it's not always related to building a protein. Um, so tyrosine is an amino acid. Tyrosinase is an enzyme and you know that because it ends in ASE, right? So the implication is that it uses tyrosine as a substrate to do some reaction, right? And one of those is to make melanin. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip all that. Da, 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 da. John Krasinski's brother. Okay. I don't know who John Krasinski is either. <laughs> Okay, good. Joy, thank you for your answer about the promoters. That's a nice description. Um, yeah, thank you. Hannah answered my question as well. Nope, don't need to know the process by which melanin is created. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose if you want to look it up, but honestly, uh, part of my job is to try to cut out some extra information that you don't really need to know. Um... Do melanosomes guard the nucleus of the skin cells? Uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, the melanosomes are just the, the sort of um, containers, like the vesicles, um, that hold the melanin. I mean, really, if you want to get technical, it's the melanin itself that doesn't let the UV light go through, right? It essentially sort of blocks it um, or absorbs it or something. I'm not, I, I can't remember right at this moment, but it doesn't let the UV radiation, uh, very much of it, into the nucleus of your cells, they're, thereby protecting your DNA. Okay, we have a clarification there about the promoter and the start codon. Thank you. Okay, Joey, I think you're starting to ask some questions that are not relevant. Okay, so I'm going to give you a warning. If you want to participate in this live stream, you need to stay relevant. Okay, um, how can viruses cause cancer? Um, okay, that's from Tessa. The, so the idea, uh, if you remember when I drew the picture on the board about how viruses, the main way they function is they actually inject their own genetic material. It can actually be DNA or RNA, but that's not critical right now. Um, and then what happens is that genetic material actually goes inside of your DNA. Like it actually sort of like inserts itself in there. So like within your sequence, it would put a different sequence of nucleotides, okay? And that means it could happen like right in the middle of a gene, right? Like it could just insert like A, G, G, A, G, T, C, like some sequence that doesn't belong there. So that could actually make it so that uh, you could not transcribe one of your own genes correctly, right? And again, if that gene has something to do uh, with the cell cycle, you know, if it relates to causing cells to divide or stopping cells from dividing or a checkpoint or apoptosis, then that could be a mutation that would contribute to cancer. Uh, Prasanth, I, you know, he's asking if substrates bind to enzymes or is it the other way around? I don't, you know, honestly, they kind of bind to each other. Um, I think people usually talk about um, the substrate binding to the enzyme, thinking that the enzyme is kind of like the stable thing and the, the substrate is sort of bouncing around and collides with it at the active site. But it's kind of not... I, I don't know that that's even like a technical thing. Um, it's almost like when you talk about like hormones and receptors. We, we typically say the hormone binds to the receptor because the receptor is sort of the stable thing that's there on the cell and the hormones are sort of flowing through your blood. So I think the thing that's sort of moving around more, we say binds to the more stable thing. I don't know. I'm kind of making that up. That's what it seems to me. Um, but it's not that critical. They, they become attached, right? And it's usually through some kind of fairly light bonding. It could be hydrogen bonding or something like that. 
Oh, thanks. Daniel just uh, attached some um, links. Okay, so when tyrosinase uses tyrosine... Oh, okay. So, Ram, let me, let me try to clarify that. Um, the tyrosinase produces the melanin itself. Melanin is a molecule. Melanosomes are more just like a little container for those molecules. Okay, so that probably has like a membrane around it or something, right? So you're going to directly produce the molecule. Um, Tejas, I, I took some time with DNA replication a bit earlier, so I'll probably refer you to listen to the earlier part of the, of the live stream for that question. Um, okay, Joy's asking about the different types of mutations. Um, so, you know, there's a big division between gene mutations and chromosomal mutations, and that has to do essentially with how much is affected, right? A gene mutation is gonna, going to affect just a single nucleotide if it happens within a gene, which it doesn't have to. Remember, most DNA is not genes. It's regulatory or does other things um, or nothing. Um, but if a mutation happens to occur to a nucleotide or a small number of nucleotides within a gene, we would say that's a gene mutation, okay? Um, and that's usually a, meaning that a nucleotide was inserted or deleted or changed or something like that. Um, when an entire chunk of a chromosome, which may or may not contain one or more genes, but it would be probably like hundreds, thousands, millions of nucleotides, like a big old chunk, like breaks off and gets detached somewhere else, or gets flipped around, right, or, you know, something like that, that's a chromosomal mutation. It affects an entire chromosome. Um, honestly, that, I don't cover that a lot in this class. It's kind of just beyond the scope of our class. Um, you do see it sometimes in cancer cells. It usually, it can be relatively harmless, but it can also signify a lot of problems within the cell. Um, uh, we went into more detail about gene mutations because that helps us to think about the process of protein synthesis, right? Because if you can start to sort of trace it back and figure out that, okay, if I change one nucleotide, a point mutation, the changing of it is called a substitution, and that's a type of mutation called a point mutation. Um, it may have this effect on the amino acid or the folding of the protein or whatever. Um, if I have a frame shift mutation, insertion or deletion, then after transcription, when the ribosome and the tRNA goes to read the mRNA, it will have displaced the groups of three in the codons. It shifts that frame, shifts the groups of three, in which case you're likely to change a large number of the amino acids after that point. Okay, So that's typically going to be a pretty dramatic change and, and almost always is going to make the protein different and non-functional. Yes, that's a, that's a good description, Ryan, about the, the function of, of melanin. Um, and then Daniel followed up. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I also kind of think of it as sunscreen. I mean, it essentially works a lot of the same way as, as a sunblock does. Um, Rhea is asking about gene expression in different phenotypes. So that is essentially what the case studies were for, right? So both case studies are cases in which changes in gene expression cause changes in phenotype right? So, you know, just briefly, since we're, we've been talking about skin color, if I have the exact same gene for tyrosinase, but I change the expression, meaning I express it, use it to do protein synthesis more often, I create more tyrosinase, the tyrosinase creates more melanin, and my skin is darker. Nothing happened to the gene. There is no difference in the gene between me, a fairly light-skinned person, and somebody with darker skin, right? The only difference is that my gene is being expressed less often, producing less quantity of the final product, okay? Um, a person with darker skin is literally expressing that gene more often, producing more tyrosinase, producing more melanin, right? So that's a difference in gene expression affecting the phenotype. Okay, with lactase, um, different kind of situation, but same thing. I'm lactose intolerant, my lactase gene is no different than somebody's lactase gene who's lacto lactose tolerant, right? It's just that my gene got turned off and their gene stayed turned on. Okay, 
And that's a difference in gene expression. My gene can no longer be expressed. That person's gene is able to be expressed and it gives us different phenotypes, okay? Okay, um, Jay is asking uh, about the question about dominant uh, and recessive, okay? So to try to summarize that, you have to connect it back with things we talked about last semester, right? Um, you want to connect it back to this idea that we have two copies of every gene, okay? So if we have instructions to make some protein, um, we potentially would make sort of two, sometimes I say two helpings, right? Like two amounts of protein, one from like our maternal chromosome and one from our paternal chromosome, right? So I would have, you know, two helpings of that protein. If I am, say there's a mutation that makes one allele non-functional, okay? If I am homozygous dominant, then I still make two helpings, no difference, right? If I am heterozygous, I only make one helping, half as much of that protein, okay? If I am homozygous recessive, I don't make any of the protein, right? Because both my alleles produce a non-functional protein. So in the case of proteins that are of alleles that code for non-functioning proteins, they're generally going to be recessive because if I have another copy, another allele that has instructions for making that protein, it's going to cover up the um, allele that doesn't have good instructions anymore, right? Because there was a mutation. The definition of recessive is that it can be covered up by something else. So if the thing we're talking about, the trait we're talking about, is something that is lacking, like O type, you know, the O allele for blood or something, or not being able to make blood clotting factor if you're hemophiliac, when the trait represents something that's lacking, it's going to be due to recessive alleles. Okay, because having that thing is always going to cover up not having it. Okay, same thing usually with light colors. Um, but not all traits are like that, right? Those are traits that are specifically the lack of something. There are other traits that are sort of the presence of something. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. But if the trait is the presence of a protein, or comes from the presence of a protein, then it's more likely to be on the dominant side. Because the presence of it will cover up the absence of it, right? So if that particular allele causes it to be present, we would say it's dominant to the other one. And sometimes the bad thing, there are a few genetic disorders that are dominant, and if you have just one copy, if you're heterozygous, that means you're making some of this protein that's causing a problem, we would call that a dominant disorder. We didn't study a lot of in this class, so one of the more famous ones is Huntington's, um, also a chondroplasia dwarfs, okay? Uh, but it doesn't have to be something bad, right? Like color is actually another good example of this because typically if you make any of the protein, then it will overshadow not making the protein. And so we would say that the allele for making some of the protein, uh, which is usually an enzyme to produce a pigment, is dominant, okay? And dominant recessive is really kind of a spectrum. Some things are more dominant and more recessive, right? Depending on how well they cover things up or get covered up. Um, and then, you know, you could always, of course, look at the heterozygous one because that brings in this idea that if it's partially covered up, if you have one helping of protein compared with two, and that gives you a different phenotype, like an intermediate phenotype, then we say it's incomplete dominance. In some cases, having one helping of protein gives you the exact same function and phenotype as if you had two. And in that case, it's complete dominance. Okay? So that's why you've got to think of the amount of the protein, like the sort of one helping, two helping, zero helpings. But you've also got to think of the function of a protein, of the function of the protein in relation to the trait. Is the, um, is the function of it something that could be covered up, right? Or is it something we're having some, like an enzyme, might be good enough, might do the same job. Um, if it's structural, oftentimes having some is not quite as good as having all of it. Sometimes it is. Again, it just really depends on how that protein relates to the trait. Okay? Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Prati's asking about cancer. So um, cancer, generally speaking, and I'm oversimplifying a bit, but let's just take it as is for purposes of this class, is a problem of accumulated genetic mutations. Okay? There's some other things related to epigenetics that we're not going to learn in this class. But let's just say for now, the main cause of cancer is accumulated mutations in the genes that are needed to have a sort of um, typical healthy cell cycle, 
okay? So they could be genes that relate to regulating the timing of cell division, uh, the frequency of cell division. They could relate to checkpoints that occur during cell division to make sure it's happening correctly. Um, they could relate to apoptosis uh, to make sure that, um, that's, that that's happening, uh, that cells that have problems are being destroyed, right? Sometimes there are mutations related to DNA repair, so you're much more likely to have mutations that cause problems. So there's a bunch of these things that make it likely that a particular cell, if you have a bunch of these mutations, will kind of event, you know, get out of control, right? Not be able to control its own cell cycle and not be able to self-destruct. And then we would say at that point, it's cancerous, right? So that gets you, if, if it's accumulated mutations that cause cancer, then of course the next question is, where do you get the accumulated mutations? Okay, and that's a bunch of things. So sort of the natural cause, again, I, I don't care for the word natural because it's kind of all natural, but, um, but the cause that's sort of built into the system that we can't prevent is this sort of regular rate of mutations that occurs just in the process of DNA replication, right? It's like clockwork. We literally can measure uh, time with the rate of DNA mutations. Uh, cells that divide more frequently, of course, are going to be more likely to get these mutations, but they just happen. It's part of life, and it's actually a good thing because it provides us with a steady rate of um, genetic variation. Okay, we'll talk about that a lot in our next unit. Um, environmental things that can cause, that's sort of a genetic cause, right? Environmental things that can cause mutations, uh, we went over the three sort of big categories, right? Radiation, um, chemicals, all kinds of chemicals, uh, viruses, right, that those are things that can cause the mutations that can lead to cancer. Um, and some of those are very specific and cause certain kinds of cancer. Some are sort of more general, right, can cause different kinds of mutations. So that's where we come into those terms, uh, mutagen, carcinogen, right? Um, let's see, anything else I need, want to say about cancer? I think that's all for now. Uh, Abi is asking, asking, okay, he asked the same question about dominant recessive, so I just answered that. I'm going to let it go. What effects to germ cells compared to somatic cells? Okay, so, so just a quick review, uh, and it looks like Larry chimed in, so let me just see what he says before I start talking. Um, Uh, yeah, Larry, Larry's commenting that in a way germline mutations are the same as somatic. I mean, the mutations themselves aren't any different, right? You could have substitutions and frame shift and all that. that that's the same. Um, you know, he's right in pointing out that the impact of it is different in the sense of remaining in your own body if it's in a somatic cell, which is any cells but your germ cells, right? Um, and therefore generally not affecting you because you have so many somatic cells, but potentially being a part of this progression to cancer, right? Um, whereas the germline mutations generally don't affect your function because your germ cells don't actually contribute a whole lot to your function. Um, they could get cancer and that happens, right? So if you get something like uh, ovarian or testicular cancer, that could have started in a germ cell. But germ cells don't, at least until puberty in males, don't divide all that much, right? Remember, they're sort of kept carefully separate and they don't actually divide all that often. Um, so they, for the most part, part don't divide until you start producing gametes actively, okay? Um, and so then you can get mutations at that time. You can also get mutations that occur early in development that could also affect the offspring, okay? Um, but, but the mutations themselves, yeah, aren't actually that much different, right? They're just, they're changes in the DNA, okay? So that's, that's a good point, Larry. Uh, Grace is asking a little bit about the genes for pigments. Yeah, just, you know, remember I said that we were uh, oversimplifying these case studies. So we're going to learn a little bit more about skin color in our next unit, but I think there's like four or five genes that affect skin color and, you know, three or four different uh, pigments, okay? So there's pigments that are sort of more light and dark. There's pigments that are a little more sort of pinkish, um, pigments that are uh, give you a little bit more of like an olive tone to your skin. So there's different, because, you know, skin is not just a few colors, right? I mean, there's sort of a huge variety of colors. So 
the there's multiple pigments that contribute to that and each one of those pigments is most likely I don't know the details of all of them but they're most likely going to be produced by their own enzymes because pigments aren't proteins right so there's probably a number of different enzymes that make these different pigments and the enzymes of course would be um, coded for by different genes okay thank you for adding your tail to the picture um, let's see what cells are melanin produced in that's going to be the melanocytes? Uh, Daniel, yeah, you're asking to clarify, is the darkening caused by an increase in the production of melanin? I, I think that's the simplest way to state it, yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know, like, completely the detail, I, if it's produced all the time and the rate increases. Like, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but, you know, for our purposes, yes, it's essentially an increase in gene expression of the tyrosinase, which then increases the production of melanin. Uh, Rand's asking what dictates gene expression. DNA does as well. It's it's an interaction, and this is actually kind of it's a, it's an interesting question that I'll try to kind of give you a short answer. Almost everything that happens with us genetically is really an interaction of genes and environment, other than sort of very early development where you're sort of on this like program developmental pathway, and even then. There's some things in the prenatal, actually a lot of things in the prenatal, prenatal environment that affect how an embryo develops. But some of that development, like cell, like differentiation, cell specialization, is sort of pre-programmed, right? It is still dependent on the environment, like around the embryo and such. But, you know, sort of the main programming is there. As we live our lives, though, like as we're sitting here right now, gene expression is really a combination of signals from the environment. Okay, like I just ate dinner, right? So... My digest, my the cells in my intestine are getting a bunch of signals to produce digestive enzymes, right? So that's an environmental impact that's causing those genes for those digestive enzymes to be expressed, right? So that's an interaction between like what I'm genetically capable of in those cells and the environmental signals. Okay, so that's how most genetics works. It's not random. It's giving us capability. To sort of, to function in whatever environment we're in. So if your environment changes, your gene expression will change, right? From minute to minute, day to day, and sometimes it changes fairly dramatically. Okay, it looks like we have kind of a whole series of questions about lactose and lactase persistence and all that good stuff. So I'm just going to read a little bit of what you guys wrote, so I don't. Um, just copy everything you said. Okay, so the original question was, if you're lactase persistent, are you producing it all the time? Okay, so that relates to what I just said about signals from the environment. Like, why would my intestinal cells pump out lactase all the time? Like, that's just not, it would be a huge waste of energy. It takes energy to make these proteins. It takes amino acids, it, which are, you know, kind of precious. You get them in your diet, right? Or you make them, and it requires ATP. So you're not going to waste a bunch of energy pumping out enzymes you don't need at that time. So it is in response to need, and there's these feedback um, mechanisms that signal your cells when to start making proteins and when to stop making them, okay? Yeah, and that's essentially what Larry said. Now, assume, the assumption here is that those genes are capable of being expressed, right? So if you are lactose intolerant, no matter how much lactose is present, they've been per the, the gene has been permanently turned off, and you know, the signal isn't going to do any good, right? Um, it's like if I have high blood glucose, that's going to signal my pancreatic cells to make insulin. The rest of my cells aren't going to do anything because they can't make insulin and they can't respond to that particular signal. So signals aren't like, most signals in our body are not universal, right? It's either a molecule that attaches to a particular receptor or it's only active in certain cells. So, you know, signals are specific to the environment and specific to certain cells. Uh, I just want to clarify something Andy said. He's talking about the regulatory gene. This is a little beyond the scope of this class. If you watched my regulation of gene expression PowerPoint, um, some regulatory reasons are genes because they code for RNA or proteins called transcription factors. So remember, a gene is something that codes for a functional product, RNA or a protein. 
Now, there are many small RNA molecules that we didn't learn about that help to regulate genes. You can also have genes for transcription factors that help to regulate genes. But then there's other parts of DNA that actually aren't genes. They act in other ways, like other molecules can bind to them to make um, regulation, to change the regulation of gene expression, but they in themselves are not genes because they don't code for a product. It's kind of a little thing, but just so you start to get a sense of using the word gene correctly. Um, there's also, and I'm just giving you like a tiny bit of information from that regulation of gene expression PowerPoint, um, there's also a lot of signals that go to the histones. So um, there are signals that go to the histones that uh, tell the histones to tighten or loosen the DNA in certain places, and that will allow that section of DNA to be expressed, right? And that could be in the short term, like signaling it, we need this protein right now, but it could actually be a longer term turning on or off um, for a long time by these signals on the histones that cause the tightening and the loosening. Okay, just like a little, little bit of extra information there. Uh, Daniel's asking for examples of all these of these different patterns. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'll do. I can do something quickly, but you know, certainly go back to genetics one and two, right? We went through tons of examples. Um, so complete dominance would be anything where having one allele completely covers. So the heterozygous heterozygous phenotype is the same as the homozygous dominant phenotype. Um, hemophilia would be a good example of that, right? Just having one functioning gene for that blood clotting factor is enough to make you perfectly healthy, okay? And that's why males with only one functioning copy on their X chromosome are just as healthy as females who have two functioning copies, okay? So that would be complete dominance. Uh, incomplete would be, say, sickle cell anemia, right, where you actually are a little bit sick if you're a carrier, if, you only, if you're heterozygous. Uh, and that's true for many colors are incomplete dominance, so many times you get a color that's sort of in between. Um, Codominance, probably the easiest case for you guys to know is like type AB blood, right? So you make both of the enzymes that attach to the A and B antigens, they don't blend, one doesn't dominate the other, you just have both, right? They're sort of equally present um, in the phenotype. Polygenic just means many genes contribute. Uh, pretty much everything, about 99% of our traits are polygenic, right? Um, you know, height, cancer risk, brain development, um, you know, body shape, uh, you know, pretty much anything you can think of, personality traits, right? Most everything is quite complicated and involves many genes and many interactions with the environment over time, right? There are only actually a rare few things that are caused by a single gene, it's just that we use them as, a, in, as examples in genetics because they are simpler to understand. So I think it kind of makes it seem like a lot more things are single gene traits, but actually that's really quite rare. Okay, so there's just a few disorders um, and a few traits. And even some of the things, honestly, that we used to teach in genetics as single gene traits turned out not to be most of them, actually. Like we used to say that eye color was just like there was a gene for eye color. There's, it's very well understood now. There's a bunch of genes for eye color. It's kind of interesting if you want to look it up um, that turn on and off and do different things. And there's some regulatory stuff in there. It's actually a great example. If I had time, I would do it in class. Um, so yeah, that's another example. Um, we used to say that whether your earlobe was attached or or sort of hanging a little bit was a single gene trait, turns out to be multiple genes. So it's actually, you know, quite difficult to find single gene traits. Yeah, Joy, you're on the right track about the lactose intolerant, right? Um, the DNA is just generally tightly condensed and isn't able, it just doesn't open up in that section, right? It's been, it's got molecules attached to it that sort of keep it closed. Uh, all the time, and so even if lactose is present, it won't sort of override that control, right, um, in order to uncoil it. Claire is uh, asking more questions about sort of melanosomes and melanin and stuff. 
I, you know, I'm not sure if the tyrosine was in those cells or it came into it. I'll be honest, you don't really need to know. It, the case study is to help us understand gene expression, not really the full thing of like how skin cells work. Uh, you know, I'll be totally honest with you. I probably will never ask you about melanosomes, okay? It's just not, it was, the case study was to understand the concept of gene expression, okay? So we're, at this point, I'm not asking you to understand like a, a great deal of detail about how skin works. Um... Mary's asking, are there other applications of recombinant DNA technology besides insulin and GM foods? Um, well, there's hundreds, literally hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands by now, applications of recombinant DNA technology. Uh, we use it to produce bacteria that can, you know, eat toxic waste. Um, you know, there's like a million not a million, but there are many, many things that we use recombinant DNA technology for. Um, but another one that we have talked about in class is uh, gene therapy, right? Gene therapy is essentially an application of, of recombinant DNA technology. If I take a gene from somebody who is uh, not a hemophiliac, right, and I take the gene for that blood clotting factor and try to insert it into a hemophiliac to fix, to give them a functioning copy of that gene, that's recombinant DNA, technology, right? And I might use a vector like a virus, although that's got a lot of issues, um, but it's essentially recombining DNA from multiple sources, right? So that would be another one that we've talked about um, a lot, but know that it is something that we use uh, quite a bit, right? But I would say humans using it to produce proteins, humans using it to create foods and agricultural products, and gene therapy are sort of the main ones that we focused on. Um, Tejas is asking about epigenetics. So just as a reminder, that's actually no longer required uh, for my test uh, or just for my unit in general. If you're curious, there's a good introduction to it uh, in school loop, either on my regulation of gene expression PowerPoint. That's probably the best place because there's a slide plus an animation built in. Um, it's actually really interesting, right? If I had to give you the 10 second version, the idea is that you know how I talked about how there's information in your genes that codes for proteins, that's one level. Then there's this other level of gene expression. Okay, well, it turns out there's a whole nother level that you guys don't even know about, and that's epigenetics. And that's not the DNA at all. It's a bunch of molecules that attach onto your DNA, right, and onto your histones that can actually help to regulate genes as well and have to regulate gene expression. They can cause, as I mentioned before, they can cause your DNA to coil up and uncoil so they could affect DNA expression that way um, and potentially actually contribute to changes in gene expression in response to your environment over your lifetime. Um, you know, in other words, like it's been associated with having like a lot of stress, like a lot of stress, like trauma or uh, starvation. Some of those things will actually change these epigenetic, what we call markers or tags, that are on your DNA, and potentially for the rest of your life, you'll actually express uh, your proteins, you'll express your genes, sorry, uh, a little bit differently, right? You might be more sensitive to stress or something like that and actually respond differently than other people, okay? So, you know, again, that's a little beyond the scope of this class, but it's this kind of whole nother level that made us honestly kind of rethink genetics, right? We thought it was all about like the, G, you know, your DNA and maybe you're in... in and their DNA would maybe interact a little with your environment, but mostly it was kind of coming from within. And epigenetics has helped us to understand that it is such a two-way street between your DNA and the environment at, at so many levels. Signals, epigenetic markers that occur as a result of the environment. Um, and that's kind of the bigger concept, I guess, you could get out of that. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to learn more if you're curious. It's a really, really fascinating area of science. Okay, Nushka is asking, how do cells know when to increase gene expression and produce more melanin when there is more sun? So, I, again, I don't know the exact mechanism, but there's something about the UV radiation. I assume that's translated into a chemical signal because that's kind of the, that's how most things work. So, probably the UV radiation is triggering some chemical signal that then affects the regulatory stuff that controls um, the expression of that gene for tyrosinase. And again, there's many pathways 
that can control gene regulation. So I don't know which one it is. Again, if you're curious about all these pathways that you can control or regulate gene expression, check out my PowerPoint, but not required for this exam beyond the scope of, of what I want to get into right now. But my guess is that there's some signal and it regulates the expression of that gene in some way, <laughs> okay? And uh, you're correct, Anushka, you also didn't need to know about splicing in transexons and, and what's called pre-RNA. No. Um, again, if I wanted to give you the 30-second version, the idea is we've been sort of presenting it in the simple way of, hey, you produce this mRNA, it goes in the cytoplasm, and the ribosome translates it. Well, it turns out there's actually a whole bunch of steps in between. You're, you have the capability to alter that RNA. Um, splice it, literally take pieces out, kind of edit it like editing a piece of film um, or a video, take pieces out and put the other pieces back together. Uh, and that enables you to create kind of more customized proteins. Um, you could in fact even use the same mRNA, cut it in different ways and produce different proteins from the same gene. In the same way that I could take uh, the same raw video footage and I might edit out some pieces to make a movie, somebody else could edit out different pieces and make a slightly different movie, right? So it's the same kind of concept. It's just, we have so many levels of control of this basic information, and it just gives us a lot of flexibility, right? We carry around this little package of genetic information that is so compact, and yet contains all this information, and we have all this ability to use the information in different ways uh, in response to different things, right? It's, it's really a, an incredible system. It's like engineers who build computers still have nothing on this, right? Um, the ability to hold so much information so compact, compactly and to use it in so many different ways, there's just no match for that um, in, you know, in the world, right? It's, it's a really amazing system. Yeah, and Lawrence, uh, Larry is using a word inhibitor. Uh, that is a word that's come up in class a few times before. It just basically means it sort of uh, stops something from happening. You sort of inhibit it. So when we talk about the regulation of genes, we use words like uh, inhib inhibitor, enhance, uh, stimulate, uh, sometimes we'll even use words like upregulate, downregulate. There's a number of words that just mean that we're mm, changing the amount uh, or the frequency of that gene expression. Okay, I see that actually questions are building up, so I'm going to try to go a bit faster. Okay, but now I have to find my place. Give me a moment. Uh, Prasant is asking about if a skin cell had a harmful mutation, would it go through apoptosis? Um, maybe. It kind of depends if the cell is able to de detect that that's a mutation that is so harmful that it would trigger apoptosis. I suspect not necessarily, but it's possible. Uh, Gabby, thanks for answering Rand's question about producing insulin. That's a nice description. Uh, Raymond, thanks for pointing out that there is an updated unit guide, so feel free to... I always try to do that, so you can always uh, print it out, uh, refer to it online, whatever you want to do. Uh, Grace, about the names for effects of mutations, um, there is one written very short written question uh, where you might need to use some of those terms. Most of them are pretty intuitive, to be honest. I mean, silent mutation, mm, right? Silence is not going to really do anything, say anything. Um, premature stop just means an early stop. Nonsense mutation is not a word that I use a lot. Uh, if you go to AP Biology, there's actually a difference between what's called a nonsense mutation and a missense mutation. Eh, we're not going to get into that. Okay, so if you don't know the exact word, you could probably describe what you mean and that would be okay. Uh, v has a question about horizontal gene transfer, which I think someone else may have sort of answered, so I'm going to kind of... Uh, I'm going to skip ahead and see if there's a good answer to that. So Larry's saying it's the direct transfer other, I think you mean of other DNA or variation in DNA. Yeah, and I would just maybe, to make that a little bit more complete, 
the implication is it's going across organisms that are living at the same time as opposed to from generation to generation. Okay, so that's the sort of horizontal aspect. And what's really important about that is it, it can happen between species, and in fact it does, right, with, with viruses um, and bacteria can infect any other species, including humans, and have, right? And that can be permanent and passed on. Um, I just heard recently, so it stands out in my mind, something like 8% of our DNA is viral DNA, right, that we've accumulated over sort of our history, right? Um, we're going to talk about horizontal gene transfer more in our next unit in evolution because it turns out to be a really important source of genetic variation, right? Not just mutations, but horizontal gene transfer provides uh, new genetic material to um, organisms kind of faster than they might get it through mutations, a lot faster. Um, Raymond's talking about his positive eugenics, higher rate of sexual reproduction of, of people with desired traits. Yeah, that that's kind of the basic idea. Um, it might also refer to what we do to create this higher rate, right? Like, are we paying people money? Are we helping them find each other and have babies, right? So it, it, are we selling eggs and sperm that have certain traits, okay? So that term could refer to any of those kinds of things that increase the inheritance of whatever is considered to be the desired trait, okay? Um, Gabby, thanks for chiming in about horizontal gene transfer. I would just add to your answer, just for your own notes, that you mentioned bacteria, but certainly viruses are also a really important um, contributor to horizontal gene transfer. Uh, interesting question, Gabby. So are, are histones receptors? I don't think they're considered a receptor in the same way that there's like hormone receptors. Um, lots of molecules combine to other molecules. We don't call them all receptors. I know, it's a little confusing. Um, histone is a complex thing because it has multiple functions. Part of it literally is a structural function. Like it literally provides kind of like this sort of scaffold for the DNA to wrap around, right? But it also is sort of intimately involved with this coiling. Right? So, I, again, I don't know the exact mechanism, but I know that there are molecules that attach to the histones that influence this coiling. I don't know that they bind to a certain shape on the histone, because as far as I know, the histones are fairly similar to each other. So I don't think it's the same way we'd use the word receptor in the sense of, like, hormones binding to a specific receptor or antibodies. Uh, well, that's kind of our main example. But but they serve a very similar function, right? So I hope you're trying to get the impression that this idea of signaling is like super important in the way living things work, right? So I'm not sure that I would say that all signaling happens through a receptor. There could be other kinds of molecules that bind to each other, but it's a similar idea. And, you know, honestly, for this course, again, that's, that's close enough, right? So I'd say technically I don't think it's called a receptor, but it has a similar function. Uh, Madeline's asking, are histones larger than DNA? Well, that's kind of a funky comparison, right? Um, DNA is like a unimaginably skinny, right? But incredibly long, right? Remember I said that if you stretched out the DNA in one single cell, it would be six feet long? Like that's kind of crazy, right? So it's super, super skinny. A protein tech, typically, although proteins have this huge variety, but something like histone, as far as I know, is kind of more globular, right? So it's kind of more compact globular shape. Um, so it's a little hard to compare long and skinny versus globular. That being said, I will tell you, like if you were talking about what we call molecular size, DNA is going to be much larger because DNA, you know, even your shorter pieces of DNA in the smaller chromosomes are literally millions of nucleotides, okay? Amino uh, proteins contain can be anywhere from hundreds, but generally thousands, but even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of amino acids, right? They vary quite a bit in size, but none of them are as big as like millions of nucleotides that are in DNA. Um, so in that sense, DNA, it has a larger molecular size, but the shapes are, are very, very different. I probably wouldn't ask you to compare those two because it's too hard. Um, 
and I would probably not ask you to compare things that vary a lot in size. Genes vary a lot in size, and proteins vary a lot in size. So, of course, smaller genes code for smaller proteins, right? If you have a bigger protein, the actual sequence of DNA that codes for it has to be bigger, right? So both genes and proteins can vary pretty dramatically in size. Oh, thank you, for Larry. Larry added to his answer about horizontal gene transfer while the original organism is still alive. Well, that's an interesting thing, Larry, because actually, isn't that true of vertical gene transfer too? I mean, I can't exactly like reproduce if I'm not still alive. So I think what you'd want to say is, well, you wouldn't even want to say both organisms are alive. Ooh, we're getting all picky here, right? Technically, viruses aren't alive. But, but really, it's just this idea of across organisms rather than from something like a parent to an offspring, right? Um, and the thing that goes in between pretty much has to be bacteria and viruses. Most other kinds of organisms are too complex, honestly, to be able to do this. Yeah, and Larry gave a nice clarification to the size issue. <laughs> Spelling is hard. I know, especially when we're trying to type fast. Um, I'd probably say typing fast is hard and spelling accurately at the same time. Which actually, I'm just going to tie this in because I can't resist. That, think about how amazing DNA replication is, right? You, it's hard for us to even type fast without making a mistake. And somehow your DNA copies like, you know, millions and bajillions of nucleotides at a rate faster than we can even imagine and hardly ever makes a mistake. Ah, it's amazing. Uh, Tejas is asking about personalized medicine. Um, so it actually could apply to a bunch of things. So Joy's answer about using it to decide what drugs might be more effective is is one of the main things that we profiled, right? Because, uh, and if you're not clear on that connection, one of the ones that you guys could understand would be the idea that when you take a medicine, it doesn't stay there forever, right? it goes away eventually because your body breaks it down, usually with enzymes, and so that, that medicine eventually gets broken down and leaves your body. That's why you have to take more, okay? But because we differ a fair amount from person to person in our sort of production of these enzymes um, and other factors, in some people the medication might be broken down immediately, in some people it might stay around for a little while, and other people it might not break down very quickly at all. So that even that factor could affect our reaction to medications, right? Um, but there's also a lot of other kinds of things that are involved in personalized medicine. What if, for example, we could figure out that, you know, individuals, because of their genes, respond differently to different foods? We could actually maybe prescribe diets that would be healthier for one person than another, right? Um, we could also have a much better idea of your personalized risk, like, imagine a world, and I don't think this is far off, where when you go to the doctor, there's your genome, and kind of like what you saw in Gattaca, it's going to print out a report saying, okay, we're just going to tell you right now, you're at high risk of colon cancer. So for you, ooh, you're going to need to have a colonoscopy every year, right? Other people, they only have to have it every five years. You get to have a colonoscopy every year. We already can do that, okay? So we could do a lot more targeted prevention, by potentially knowing more what to look for, right? So there are, and there's a number of other things that I'm probably not even thinking of right now where it could apply, we could apply your genetic information to keeping you healthier, uh, potentially putting off illness or helping to uh, prevent it or potentially helping to treat it earlier, uh, treat it more effectively, right? Maybe we would know that the pathway of your cancer is going to be more aggressive, therefore we should like take out the whole part versus just let you live with it for a while, right? So it could affect the treatment even once you have a condition. And again, we already do this to some extent in cancer, right? We can look at the, we've already sequenced a lot of cancer genes. So we have some idea for some cancers, we're not all the way there yet, but for some cancers, what kind of chemotherapy they'll be sensitive to or resistant to, um, how aggressive that cancer might be, not always, but sometimes, right? So, you know, again, there's, there, and there's probably applications of this in medicine that we, we don't even know about yet, right? This is what's sort of exciting and weird and a little scary about genetics is there's probably so much more potential in the future that we can't even imagine right now.
Uh, Raymond's asking about the term vector. Uh, vector is actually kind of a general, it's actually got a bunch of, I know it has a meaning in math, this is a slightly different but related meaning. Um, a vector is anything that sort of is a means to transport or connect one thing with another, okay? So if we're talking about malaria, the vector is a mosquito because it helps to transmit uh, this parasite that causes malaria from one organism to another. If we're doing gene therapy, we might use a virus as a vector, okay? So the vector is just the, the thing that sort of carries whatever it is. In terms of biology, it's usually either used in the context of diseases, right, like what's transmitting the disease, or in the context of um, recombinant DNA technology. Marvin, that's a great question. He's asking about, couldn't we make GM crops with no disadvantages? <laughs> I don't know, can, can humans create anything with no disadvantages? I mean, that, you know, in the scheme of things, that's pretty hard. Obviously, we're trying, right? Um, we're trying to make GM products, most people are, that are way more helpful than harmful. But I think saying no disadvantages is kind of a stretch, right? I mean, there is usually going to be some kind of a downside, right? Um, you know, for many of the reasons that I talked about earlier in the live stream. But obviously this is something we should be aware of, right? Uh, that we want it to be something with mostly advantages and not mostly disadvantages. And those disadvantages could be biological, they could be environmental, they could be social, they could be economic, right? So in those senses, it's kind of hard I, I can't imagine a situation in which it would be so perfect that there's not some kind of downside. Maybe. That would be great. I can't think of one right now. Uh, Rand's asking, would there be sort of open-ended questions on the test about the ethical issues related to biotech? Uh, no. I think that would take a long time for you to describe, and actually I'm kind of using your biotech interactive for that, right? Because you already went to their trouble to write about the technology and about the ethical issues. So that's that's how I'm assessing you on that, okay? So no, there's not going to be anything that involved um, on the exam. Okay, Larry came and clarified horizontal gene transfer, which I'll probably start to call HGT. It's a little easier. Uh, is genetic testing mean sequencing your genome or prenatal testing? Okay, so I'm going to clarify this because actually I'm already seeing a lot of people on their biotech interactive that are confusing these two things. Sequencing a genome is not exactly the same as genetic testing. Sequencing a genome literally just means the sequence. A, T, G, A, T, C, C, G. It is independent of what you use that sequence for. Okay, one of the applications of sequencing genomes, of what we call genomics, Okay, there are many applications. What can we use that information for? We can identify a dead body. We can figure out who the father of the child is. We could do genetic testing. All of these applications, or, or not all of them, but many of them, involve comparing sequences of DNA, which is different than getting a sequence for a particular organism, right? We sort of generally know what the functional sequences for many human genes are, right, that create proteins that work. That allows us to compare a person's sequence with those sort of known functional sequences, A, T, G, G, A, C, T. Oh, you have a T instead of a G in this position, right? We know that when you have that particular change, that it makes that resulting protein non-functional, and we would call that sort of a bad mutation, and you might have disorder. Or we might actually say, hey, you have a T instead of a G. It turns out that's actually a common variant for humans. Lots of humans vary at that particular uh, nucleotide uh, site, okay? And there's a term for that. It's probably, you might have run across it in your biotech readings. It's called SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, and that means that that is a typical site that varies from human to human. And some of those, most of them mean nothing, right? A few of them relate to traits that are different from human to human. Uh, Marlis is asking about the effect of most mutations. 
you know, in the global scheme of things, most of them, if I had to guess, are probably silent. Because most, so, and I'm going to talk about somatic mutations, most of them are going to happen in parts of DNA that aren't even being used in that cell, right? So that would be the vast majority of them. A, a small number would actually affect the functioning of that cell, right? So, you know, and then you get into all the layers of like whether it changes the protein and this and that, you know, but I would say that a lot of mutations won't make much difference at all. And even the ones that you have in every cell of your body, which we do all have some of those as well that we inherited, many of those don't make that much difference. There are fairly minor difference that actually just kind of makes us different, but isn't necessarily harmful. So remember, another word is neutral. So there are going to be a number of mutations that are not silent means specifically that it doesn't even change the the protein and has kind of like no effect at all. But there's this idea of a neutral mutation where it's not an advantage or a disadvantage, but it's different, okay? And so there's going to be a number of mutations that kind of fall into this neutral category. And maybe in some environments they're an advantage or a disadvantage, maybe not in the environment you're currently in or at this time, right? Okay, yeah. Joey's back, and honestly, he's not being a positive contributor, so we're just going to remove him. Okay, so you guys, we want to keep this a good site for us to do these live streams, okay? So um, thank you for calling out people who are not contributing, uh, and I will do my part as well. Okay, let me go back a little ways. Yeah, there's some questions about what's going to be on the exam. Um, you know, there's not like a direct how does meiosis work kind of question. You know, at some point, I know there's actually questions on final for the semester that has a reference to meiosis because kind of hard to talk about reproduction without that, but that's not what it's about. There's not like a bunch of questions about the details of meiosis. I, I can't even remember. I don't think there's any references to it on this exam. Um, but I mean, you know, there might be references to reproduction or, you know, or I think there, okay, I'm, I'm going to correct myself. I think there's one reference to it, but if you should know it, <laughs> okay? So there's nothing like detaily that you would like need to spend a lot of time studying for. Uh, yes, protein synthesis means specifically the two processes of transcription and translation. Uh, Pernay, we talked about histones briefly before. They have multiple functions, structural, literally helping the DNA to wrap up and sort of stay neat and tidy, also to help it condense, and they have regulatory function as well. Um, Raymond, yes, horizontal gene transfer is part of biotechnology. Um, if it's not on the unit guide, it should be, and I'll write myself a note about that. It becomes very important in evolution, and so I've kind of gotten into where I start introducing it during uh, genetics because it's so relevant to, to biotechnology. So I will make a note to myself if it's not on the unit guide to put it there. Um, so yes, consider it on there. Uh, Anushka is asking about the SRY gene translocation. Um, Anushka, that is technically first semester. I, I certainly won't be asking about that um, on this test. Um, it's not really a trans... It could actually be a translocation. That's another way it could happen. Yeah, actually, is it a translocation? Let me think. It's, it's generally an error that occurs with crossing over, uh, which I, I suppose is kind of a translocation because you're moving part of the... Y chromosome onto the X chromosome, so yeah, that might not be a bad term for it, um, but not all translocations are related to crossing over. That might be a special case, but again, honestly not relevant uh, to this test, okay? Um, uh, Gabby, as far as the written questions, most of them literally are, I mean, obviously I don't want to tell you exactly what they are, right? But honestly, most of them are like one word, right? They're literally like uh, identifying something on a drawing, right? or something like that, or a particular term. There's one question that you're explaining a term that you put, okay? And that's it. So it's really, um, it's not a big essay or anything like that at all, okay? Mostly just terminology. 
Um, Yeah, so I just talked about the completion questions. Uh, it will be a transcription and translation, just, you know, pretty much what you did on the uh, checkup where you had to sort of show that you could transcribe and translate. No, no Punnett squares. Yeah, and, and thank you, Raymond, for, for making that comment. Uh, I said that there wouldn't be like written questions about the ethics of biotechnology, but yes, it is included in some of the multiple choice questions. So do make sure you're familiar with the major ethical issues um, that, you know, that we went over a few different times. Okay, Abby, so uh, to clarify again about mutagens are anything that causes mutations. Sometimes they're substances, sometimes they're viruses. UV radiation would be a mutagen, right? So anything that can change, can cause mutations and change the DNA, we would call a mutagen, okay? Um, some of those change DNA in places that affect the cell cycle. Those would also be carcinogens because carcinogens cause cancer, right? So generally speaking, again, for a sim slightly simplified level, uh, most of the carcinogens that you guys know about are also mutagens. That's how they cause cancer. There are actually some other factors involved in cancer that we haven't discussed. Um, Prasant is asking about the three layers of skin. I think you're talking about like the epidermis and the dermal layer and all that. You know, again, and this is not really about the skin. Um, the reason we use skin is mostly for the example of skin color. It also happens to be a good example of cells that have to divide a lot, right? That are constantly replacing themselves. So they would constantly have to be expressing this, the tyrosinase gene to make more melanin. So it's a good example of gene expression, but again, the structure of the skin is not, not really what we're studying, so, so don't worry about that. <laughs> they just did find out, though. That's fine. It's kind of interesting, right? Um, epi means on the out. Yeah, thank you. Even before I could even say it, um, epi's on the outside. Uh, hypo means underneath, like a hypodermic needle. Um, Okay, Rayon, I'm not going to tell you exactly what diagrams will be on the test. Uh, there's a few we've looked at as part of this unit that you've seen a bunch of times. It's not a surprise, okay? Uh, to be clear, horizontal gene transfer is where bacteria go side by side and they exchange DNA in order to reproduce the traits of another variety. Um, that's one type of horizontal gene transfer, um, Raymond. Uh, that's a type that's called conjugation. That's not the only type. Um, Another one that's important is called transformation. Might even be more important for us um, for reasons you'll understand later. And that's this idea that a bacteria can take in DNA that's around it. So if you have kind of a whole soup like in our intestines of lots of bacteria and they're living and dying all the time and falling apart and doing whatever they do, if there's pieces of DNA literally sort of floating in all this liquid around the cells, right, that another bacteria can take in that DNA and just sort of incorporate it. Um, you know, if it's a little plasmid or even just a little strand of DNA, it can sort of take it in and incorporate it and it might start expressing those genes, okay? So that is also an example of horizontal gene transfer and of course it could also involve viruses, right? So the term horizontal gene transfer is specifically about this idea of moving genetic information across organisms rather than passing it on through reproduction. Okay, uh, Ram, you don't have to, to apologize. I appreciate that you're asking lots of questions. Um, so you're asking about a gene being expressed, not expressed, or just turned off for good. Okay, so, you know, again, I, what makes that happen is kind of beyond the scope of this. I've talked about a few things, but I'm going to let that part go for now. What I said in class was that we tend, and this is not a hard and fast rule. I didn't read this anywhere. It seems to be a pattern I've noticed, and it's not 100% consistent. But what I have noticed is that when I read about biology, usually the term turn off and turn on means for a long time, right? Like either during development for the rest of our life or some major change, um, you know, like when the lactase gene is turned off. 
um, a gene being expressed is purely the act of using the information in the gene to make RNA or protein, right? So that is happening constantly in all our cells at all times. So if we use the terms in that way, then you could only express a gene that is currently turned on, right? Now, somebody pointed out to me today that in your textbook where it talks about the LAC operon, which I didn't ask you to read because I knew that would be confusing to people, it says that the gene is turned on sort of to be expressed. And that's not the way that, remember that book is pretty old, right? And I can tell you that most of the time we would just say the gene is expressed and we would leave the turning on and off and on to talk about this sort of larger, longer term regulation. Okay, but again, it's not 100% consistent. It's just kind of how the terms are, are generally used. Um, Mike, hi. We talked a little bit before about somatic and germ cells. So if you think of somatic as being sort of the body cells that contribute to most of your function, if we are going to do gene therapy for those, we are replacing... Typically, if it's therapy, therapy means therapeutic, sort of contributing to health, right? We would be ch changing genes that are potentially causing a genetic disorder in your somatic cells, right? So, for example, say you have sickle cell anemia, and the cells that are in your bone marrow are not able to produce good hemoglobin, and therefore you have sickle cell anemia, okay, in your red blood cells. We could potentially get a replacement healthy gene into your bone marrow and allow that or cause that to be in many cells in your bone marrow which would then be able to produce hemoglobin and make functional red blood cells okay now that process is quite complicated because you have millions of cells in your bone marrow probably billions and we have to get rid of all the ones that don't work then we have to try to replace them with ones that do work, and all this process is very complicated. Some people die. It's it's much harder than it sounds. Like, oh, let's just replace the genes, the cells, genes that don't work. In practice, gene therapy is quite difficult. We are working on it, and in some cases it's been successful, but it's kind of really still in the pretty early st stages. Okay, there's a lot of clinical trials, very early stages of treating people uh, with gene therapy. There's some we've done for a while, but it's it's problematic. Um, okay, now that I'm reading your question carefully, it says the difference between somatic and gene therapy. I think you mean somatic and germ cell gene therapy. So germ cell gene therapy is the same basic process, right? Replacing a gene with a better functioning gene, only it would be in the germ cells, those diploid cells that contribute, that divide to make your gametes, or... It could be the gametes themselves, and then sort of in common usage, we might even talk about the embryo, okay? So the idea is that then we're not worrying about you so much. You've already got this undesirable gene in all your cells, all your trillion cells. But what we're hoping to do in that case is to fix some genetic disorder in your offspring. So because all you're passing to your offspring is one copy of that gene, like just one, not millions and millions and trillions, right? So if we could just fix that one, that would be in the, the sperm of the egg, we could potentially make it so that your entire offspring has all good genes, right? Or at least for that particular um, gene we're interested in. Again, that's still harder than it sounds. You actually have a whole number of germ cells, right? So in practice, this would probably come down to taking somebody's sperm and egg in a lab and fixing them there or fixing the early embryo and putting it back into a woman to, you know, uh, have the baby develop, okay? Uh, we cannot imitate development in a lab. So that is the, the contextual difference. Is it, is it in your somatic cells that are mostly about your own personal function right now and therefore any changes would die with you? Or are these changes in germ cells that would be passed on potentially to become an entire new organism and therefore we are changing all of your descendants forever and ever and by implication kind of the, a little, little bit of the entire human species. Okay, the human gene pool. So Rand's asking about how the lactase gene is always turned on uh, at birth. So that relates to us being mammals, right? So all mammals, because they're mammals, uh, drink milk from their mothers as part of their early stages, okay? Um, so, you know, 
that first of all, not even all organisms might have a lactase gene, right? Human, you know, mammals aren't the only ones because there's other organisms that can break down lactase, things like lactobacillus bacteria. But let's just stick with mammals for now, right? Um, mammals have to have a functioning lactase gene more or less to survive. I mean, yeah, in the last few decades, humans could probably come up with like some soy formula or something, but generally speaking, throughout evolutionary history, mammals have to have a functioning lactase gene to survive, right? So any rare human that had a de novo mutation, like the mutation occurred in the germline or in the early embryo, so that that human was born without the ability to produce lactase, would probably die as a little baby, right, within a few days of birth because it couldn't get any nutrition, okay? So it would make sense for that gene to always be turned on for all babies, but then at some point, because in most of nature and in most of human history, babies would stop getting milk from their mothers after a certain time, right? And humans, mm, after the age of one or two or three or something like that, right? So then it's just sort of more efficient to turn that gene off in the cells after a certain period of time. So that is the sort of pre-programmed regulation, right, of those particular cells is to turn off that gene sometime after weaning, after nursing stops, right? Um, probably throughout all mammals, and I mean, I'm sure, I don't even have to say probably. If you had a million mammals of any sort, would some of them have a mutation that causes lactase persistence? Sure, mutations are random. They happen all the time, right? But sometimes they become more frequent if there is an advantage, if there is selection. And that's what we'll talk about in our next unit. So there are groups of humans of certain ancestry where they not only had this mutation, because that happens randomly, but it was selected for, they had more babies, and so we have these sort of clusters of humans with similar ancestry that all have this trait of lactase persistence. Okay, and again, we're going to get into this more in our next unit. Okay, um, good reminders about checking your resources, right? So good reminders about some of the short videos, like what is a gene, uh, some of the diagrams that are built into your handouts. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't noticed already this year, you guys, like, you know, be smart and strategic about this, right? Like, I have certain pictures that I get, usually from the internet, right? And usually I put those pictures on your handouts, and guess what? I usually just put the same picture on your desk. A, because you've seen it, and I know you're familiar with it, and it's easier for me. It's kind of rare that I put a picture you've never seen on a test. If I do, it's on purpose, because I want to know that you can apply something you've learned to a new diagram, right? A new setting or a new picture, right? So some cases I will do that. But oftentimes if it's something where I just want you to see some particular drawing, I'll put the same drawing on, right? We did that with biomolecules, right? You had the same drawing on like three different handouts and then you had it on your quick quiz and then you had the same drawings on your test, right? So, I mean, if you, you should be just as comfortable and familiar with drawings and diagrams as you are with written things. Right, and I know I feel like a, a broken record on this, but you know, think of diaga diagrams and drawings as another source of information to text. You should be creating drawings and diagrams in addition to text. You should be understanding drawings and diagrams. You should be studying them in your textbook or your handouts when they appear, just the same way you would study text. Okay, so it's just another source of information. A uh, question about nature and nurture. So is the nature-nurture argument about whether genetics or environment affects the behavior capabilities of individual? In a broad sense, yes. It doesn't have to be capabilities. It could be any trait, but let's face it, that's mostly what we care about, right? But also things like personality, I'm not sure, I'd, you know, which might relate to behavior, right? So the things we're most interested in, the things we actually argue over, right, um, is usually about things like our behavior, our capabilities, but it could also be things like, you know, like we talked about the example of, um, you know, body weight, right? Which, of course, has a connection to behavior, but it's the entire trait, okay? So it's, it's sort of anything where we might want to know or better understand or have an opinion about um, whether something is 
what the different contributions are from genetics and environment, and perhaps whether one or the other of those is mm, sort of more important, even though we understand that they both interact. Uh, are somatic cell mutations super benign? Mostly, you know, but again, not always, right? We have to connect somatic cell mutations to cancer. Um, it's possible also that you would have, and you saw this on the HHMI uh, poster and inter interactive, this idea that a, a somatic cell mutation that occurs during development could actually affect a big cluster of cells in your body, right? Because if it happens in the early stages of development, those cells will multiply a lot and they'll make some whole part of your body. So that those aren't germ cells, those are somatic cells, right? So that would be another situation in addition to cancer where a single somatic cell mutation could easily become part of many cells in your body and could then affect your function. Uh, Raymond's asking about uh, conjugation and transformation compared with transduction. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I won't even expect you to know the terms conjugation and transformation, and those are the only ones that I described. Um, I'm kind of lumping a lot of that under horizontal gene transfer, just because, honestly, the details of how it works aren't that important for our course. But I think to understand about genetic variation, you do need to understand the general idea of, of horizontal gene transfer, because that's where a lot of genetic variation in organisms comes from. Chris is asking the activity we did. Yeah, we're deciding things like intelligence lie on the spectrum. Yes, right? And I kind of picked for that activity some of the more controversial ones, but you could potentially talk about nature nurture in relation to, you know, many things. It comes up a lot when people talk about, like, raising children, right? Um, you know, gender, uh, gender expression, huge, right? I didn't even put that on there. I only put sexual orientation. But it's a big debate around gender, uh, around you know, sort of how people express their gender, whether they're more, they express gender in a more masculine or feminine way, or, or some of each, uh, where they get their gender identity, how they feel, is that more genetic or environmental, um, you know, behavior related to that, right? So there are many traits that weren't on the paper I gave you that are part of this quote debate, right? Some of them are sort of more interesting and controversial than others. But in general, nature nurture just means what factors do we think contribute to some trait. Okay, um, let me just say something about the genetics test. Okay, because there's a whole discussion on test versus exam versus quiz. So I will kind of make one statement because actually it came up between the biology teachers just today, okay? In my class, just to be clear, I call anything a test where I'm testing your knowledge and you don't get to use your notes, right? Um, tests, I usually use the term quiz if it's a smaller test and exam if it's sort of a unit ending bigger test, right? Or a semester ending bigger test, right? That's not set in stone, that's just kind of how I usually use those terms. Because my genetics unit was so super short and we haven't actually had a quiz yet, I'm just going straight to the exam. All we really had was the little quick quiz, right? We didn't have kind of like an intermediate quiz like we often do. So it's the genetics exam. It's the end of the unit, that's what I'm doing. In the other bio classes, because I just discussed this with them today, they're trying to decide actually because they're having a genetics quiz tomorrow, I believe, at least in some of the classes that covers like protein synthesis uh, and some stuff around DNA. They're going to end their genetics unit, remember, one week later than me. So there we're still trying to figure out, should we have a, quote, genetics exam when we just had a quiz a week earlier? Maybe we should just make it another quiz. Maybe we should call it an exam but not make it very big, right? So they were actually having a whole discussion about that. So if that's where that discu the discussion in the chat is coming from, if you guys are comparing across teachers, that's why it's a little confusing because their unit is one week longer and they decided to have this quiz in the middle, so now they're kind of not sure what to do. And they may have made a decision. I'm sure they'll let you know. Uh, I will tell you that across teachers, we are working really hard. It's, it's what we talked about on our release day when all the bio teachers were absent. One of the big things we talked about is making sure that we're having – kind of equal weight in points for things. So whether we're calling it a quiz or exam, we're all going to try really hard to make 
the sort of point value, the percentage of your grade, the weighting, similar for the amount of time that we spent on it, right? So the amount of points overall that we give, that we count for genetics, should be pretty similar from teacher to teacher, whether we're calling it a quiz or an exam or what. Okay, so a little lengthy answer, but it just came up today uh, with the teachers, so I wanted to kind of clarify that. Um, Kevin's asking about the greenhouse effect. I'm going to be honest with you, Kevin. Uh, that's that's kind of way beyond the scope of this particular um, live stream, right? Because it's focused on the genetics exam. Um, we do have lots of good resources. You can even check a live stream from the ecology unit, but I don't want to get into that right now because it's just not relevant at all to the genetics unit. Um, FYI, climate change will come back in our evolution unit, okay? Uh, how would the structure of DNA prove to be important to its function? Um, in many ways, right? So, you know, there's a whole idea in biology in general that sort of structure helps determine function, right? Structure being how things are made, what they're made of, how they're connected, all that. And that that, in many ways, function depends a lot on the sort of physical structure of things, right? As we've talked about, for example, the enzymes have a particular structure that allow them to bind to the uh, substrate, right? So if you think of DNA, there's a lot of things about how the physical structure works that relate to its function. That's why we spent time learning about the molecule, right? So this idea, of, for example, of the hydrogen bonds being down the middle, that means that when, when the enzymes are trying to split the DNA to unzip it, right, to open it up, it breaks right along those hydrogen bonds because structurally those are weaker bonds than in the backbone, right, the sugar phosphate portion. So that allows replication to happen, or transcription, to happen fairly easily because the whole molecule is not going to break apart, right? That if you put a certain amount of force in a certain place, it's only going to break the hydrogen bonds down the middle and not break apart the entire molecule, right? So that's kind of just one example of how the structure affects the function. Also, you could connect it to the idea of condensing, the idea of sort of the backbone protecting the data in the middle, um, the idea that single-stranded RNA is going to have all those sticky ends that the nucleotides that could match up with other things as opposed to DNA that connects the nucleotides with each other in the middle and therefore doesn't easily react with other molecules and so it's very, very stable over time. Things like that. <laughs> Thanks, Larry, for piping in about the greenhouse effect. Um, okay, so I think we're, it's, it's 9.37. I do want to move towards wrapping up. So if you have any last questions, uh, pipe in. Otherwise, um, you know, you've got lots of good resources. Honestly, I will tell you, I don't think it's one of the harder tests of the year. Students generally do pretty well overall. I think you'll be fine. Um, but, you know, feel good. Get some good sleep tonight. Review any last things that you felt unsure about. Um, but otherwise, yeah, feel good. You, you've worked hard. You did good. You're going to ace the exam tomorrow. Okay. So um, have a wonderful evening. Uh, get to sleep soon. And I will see you all tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you're very welcome. And have a good night. Bye-bye.